was very much the Cortona that I remember from nearly 50 years ago. The clips we are looking at are from a Rai documentary that was made in 1979. I was in my mid-twenties and I had never been to Italy before. It was really pure chance that dictated I should spend the summer of 1972 in Cortona and the two subsequent summers, 1973 and 1974. I had read a law degree at Cambridge and embarked on a career as a barrister. But it soon became apparent I was in the wrong career, so I gave it all up and took a leap in the dark. My Cambridge college kindly agreed I could return to do a two-year study of the history of art. But before going back, however, I took myself to art school to learn how to look, to draw and to paint, and at a friend's suggestion, decided to spend the summer in Tuscany at the very heart of the Italian Renaissance. With only halting Italian, no contacts, and having no idea where to go in Italy, I placed an advertisement in the Times newspaper and received just one reply, offering a delightful house in the centre of Cortona, Trentasetti via Berettini, happily situated on a precipitous street, halfway between the main marketplace and Fra Angelico's San Domenico. Cortona in those days was a slightly run-down market town visited by relatively few tourists. There was a small expatriate community of writers and artists, mostly Anglo-American, who looked kindly on me and the many friends who came to stay, and they took us under their wing. Thus it was that I came to know Umberto Morra. So I do thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in the conference. I thought that what I might do is first of all talk about the Mora that I knew in the 1970s. And then my wife and I would like to talk about the Mora that we came to discover over 30 years later when we were researching the correspondence between Bernard Berenson and Kenneth Clark and spent several months in the archives at Itati. Next, however, a glimpse of the Villa Mora to give you a taste of what it was like and how character forming it was for a young man on the threshold of a new career to be welcomed and treated like a godson by a man of such courtesy and distinction. Many were the occasions when we would take the winding road from the centre of Cortona down into the valley to visit George Deem and Ronald Vance at Sardangelo, the Harrisons at Pergo, Lindel Passerini at Palazzone, and of course Umberto Morra at Metelliano. It was Lindel Passerini who had married Renzo Passerini who was the principal bridge between the Anglophone community and that of the Italians. Palazzoni, dating back to the 13th century, was the ancestral home of the Passerinis, and I'm fairly certain that it was at a drinks party there that I first met Umberto Morra. He and Renzo were close friends with similar liberal, social and political opinions. Indeed, I think it was a matter of pride to the local citizens of Cortona that their community harboured not just one, but two Conti Rossi. 
To be invited to lunch at the Villa Mora was a great honour, not granted to everyone. I could also see that once it became known in the town that I was a regular visitor there, it conferred on me by association a certain respect and acceptance. Hospitality at the Villa Mora was not lavish, but the company was always interesting, and it pleased Mora to mix old and young, the insignificant and the well-known together. There was a certain formality and ritual which was pleasing rather than oppressive. Before lunch, guests were always offered a glass of that dark bit of vermouth, punte mez, which Mora called Carpano. It came from his father's native city, Turin, and the distinguished building which became the company's headquarters was the palace where his father had been born. It was, I think, a sort of acknowledgement of his Piedmontese heritage. After lunch, guests were offered cake and the local vin santo, an acknowledgement of his Tuscan blood and heritage. Indeed, it was from his mother that Mora inherited his much-loved country house at Metelliano, and it has been well said that Mora's head was in Tuscany, but his heart was in Piedmont. As you will probably have already heard, Mora's father, who had pursued a highly successful career in the military, politics and diplomacy, had married at the advanced age of 65 and, for the first time, the beautiful 40-year-old widow of Piero Laparelli from one of the oldest and most distinguished families in Cortona. The tantalising rumour which was constantly hinted at but which is in fact utterly untrue, was that Moro was the result of a liaison between his mother and King Umberto, and indeed there was a resemblance between them, and that Mario, the white-coated manservant, who was Moro's faithful and devoted attendant, was the child of a liaison by his father with a local peasant girl. From his father, Mora inherited a certain Piedmontese dryness and severity of character, a love of history and of foreign travel, of politics and diplomacy. It has been speculated that his father's bloody suppression of a peasant uprising in Sicily in 1884 caused Mora to turn against his father and pursue left-wing ideals. Personally, I think this is unlikely. Rather, I would like to suggest that he inherited from his father an intense patriotism and love of country. In the father, this manifested itself in unswerving loyalty to the monarchy. In the son, it was manifested as an equally deep loyalty to constitutional democracy and modern liberty. Mora was devoted to his parents and he preserved the Villa Mora as a shrine to them and to the king and queen who were his godparents. To end these brief recollections of the 1970s, I would like to show you a short film clip of Mora from the 1979 documentary. But before doing so, I should read from a letter that he wrote to me in the autumn of 1976. I had stayed with him at the Villa Mora in 1973, so I can vouch at first hand for his Spartan living conditions, and that the simple bedrooms were like an ice box even at the height of summer. Then I returned in the summer of 1974, back to the same house in Cortona, and there I fell in love with the girl I was destined to marry. Together, we visited Mora for the last time on our honeymoon in June 1975, but I corresponded with him until he died. I keep a book of souvenirs and letters. Here is the young me that Mora knew in 1972. And here is a letter from him dated 1976, 
that explains his increasing frailty. Dear Robert, you made me extremely happy with your letter. I think it was worth to undergo a bad motor accident if the text that you composed for me was meant as its reward. It hasn't been a good moment for convalescing, but your letter brought me bright memories of our private talks and the palpable results of your endeavours. So the sun began again to shine and I was restored to former views about life, which were far from pessimistic. My accident has kept me in almost complete immobility since the beginning of June. I have grave doubts about my future condition, if I'll be able to regain my independency when I'll be dismissed from all medical attendance. Besides, Cortona made you meet the person that is now your chosen companion. Please accept for your wife and yourself all my best wishes and do not forget me. Qui siamo nella stanza d'ingresso che però ho sempre visto ad operare come stanza di soggiorno, perlomeno nelle stagioni calde, perché evidentemente qui è vero, c'è cioè una stufa in quell'angolo, però è una stufa che non si può accendere, quindi questa stanza è sempre servita come una specie di, di stanza dove si incontravano gli amici, dove si viveva normalmente eh, durante l'estate. Accanto, qui a sinistra, c'è quello che si chiama, direi in tutta la Toscana, probabilmente anche in Umbria e probabilmente in tutta l'Italia centrale, il salotto buono. Ora, il salotto buono, nella tradizione della mia famiglia, è il salotto in cui non ci si siede mai. Ci sono i tratti di reali un po' dappertutto, per il fatto che mio padre era piemontese e ha fatto tutte le campagne di indipendenza, cominciando dal 48. Mio padre fu nominato alla fine della sua carriera militare ambasciatore a Pietroburgo. Ci sono infatti tutte le fotografie della famiglia imperiale russa. Uh, del periodo della Russia me ne ricordo molto poco, che avevo 13 mesi quando andai la prima volta uh, con mia madre e dovetti lasciarla a quattro anni e mezzo perché ero stato affetto da una tubercolosi ossea. Infatti, se non quando ero proprio un bambino, Friendship with Mora was, in a sense, rekindled about 10 years ago when we received an invitation to visit Itati, and remembering his admonition, do not forget me, we asked if he could look, visit the archives and look at material that might relate to Mora. We were offered one rather meagre file 
that contained but a handful of papers. Our disappointment was palpable, yet as we looked at it, I seemed to receive a tap on the shoulder and hear a familiar voice saying to me, Well, Robert, I'm sorry that you are so disappointed, but what did you expect? As you know, I spent a lot of time here, especially before the war, and you do not write letters to people that you see every day. Also, as you know, I never kept anything, and as soon as I had answered any letter, I threw it away. However, I really do not wish you to feel that you have had a wasted journey, so may I suggest that you ask for the Clark files. Half an hour later, we were given several thick bundles of correspondence, and that was just the beginning. Between 2008 and 2011, we spent several months at Itati, at various times, transcribing the letters between Kenneth Clark and Bernard Berenson. Our researches led to an invitation to talk about Mora and his place in the Berenson household at a convenue at Itati in 2009, and from that developed our book, which was published by Yale University Press in 2016. Kenneth Clark and Mora first met at Itati in 1925, and being close in age, they became devoted lifelong friends. Clark's first visit to the Berensons was not actually a great success, but he later wrote, quote, The thought of meeting Umberto again was one of the factors which made me look forward to returning to the world of Itati in the following autumn. Clark made a documentary about Berenson and Itati in 1971, and this short extract gives, we hope, a vivid impression of what it was like to have lived there and been a part of the Berenson entourage. This is the Villa Ritati, near Florence, where on New Year's Day 1900, Bernard Berenson made his home and where he continued to live for the next 58 years. I lived here myself for some years, off and on in the 20s, and then I came back here after the war, sometimes for a month at a time. It was a sort of second home to me. There are many more spectacular villas in Italy, but none that have played a greater part in the culture of life of Europe and the United States for over half a century. People from all over the world, clever people, stupid people, journalists, GIs in uniform, crackpots, philosophers, hundreds of pilgrims made their way to Itati, not just uh, duchesses and art dealers, but all sorts, including, of course, a lot of old friends, like Yehudi Menuhin and Walter Lippmann, and, often Mr. of all, Umberto Marra, the Italian writer whose liberal views had made him Bibi's closest friend in the years of fascism. They all streamed in through this door and walked rather gingerly up a slippery marble corridor in order to have an audience, that's really the only way of putting it, with Mr. Berenson. Who was he? And why was he so famous? A short answer is that he was an art critic. But uh, art critics are not normally the subject of legend. There was much more to it than that. He was born in 1865 in a small town in Lithuania, the son of a leading Jewish family. As a result of various persecutions, his family moved to the United States when he was 10 and he was brought up in the old North Quarter of Boston, where many European immigrants had taken refuge. Could one say that Beebe's fame passed through four phases? First, from 1890 to 1900, the brilliant young man, whose criticism, destructive and constructive, earned him fame and admiration. Second, from 1900 to 1930, the all-powerful expert and social lion. 
third from 1932 to 1940, a sort of retirement almost forgotten as a writer, much less in demand as an expert. And then, after the war, an extraordinary rebirth as a legend and a sage. Itati had a character outside of time, and this has been preserved because it now belongs to the University of Harvard, his old university, which with extraordinary tact has managed to keep its original atmosphere while adding the conveniences of a modern institution. One of the nice things about him was that, in spite of all his disillusioning experiences and his vast knowledge of history, with all the grounds for pessimism which that provides, he never became a pessimist. He was incurably hopeful. Itati operated like a Renaissance court, B.B. being the prince and monarch. At his beck and call were three important women, on whom he was utterly dependent. First, there was Mary Berenson, a monster with the ability to send her husband into head-banging rages. Then there was Alda Anrep, who was the all-important librarian and the court entertainer. And most importantly, there was Nikki Mariano, who was a saint, and who held the whole court together, and with whom Mora had a brother-sister relationship. Kenneth Clark again. Perhaps this is the right place to say something of Mrs. Berenson, because she was not only the target for a good many of these rages, as she is, but she was also responsible for the expansion of Itati. Mrs. Berenson was a character almost as exceptional as her husband. Her mother was a religious teacher in Philadelphia, Quaker, and an ardent feminist. Her brother was the American writer Logan Pearsall Smith, and her sister married Bertrand Russell. Mary Berenson is said to have been a beauty, and Mr. Berenson fell in love with her at quite an early age. By the time I knew her, she was very large and unwieldy. Mr. Berenson was small and nimble and the sight of them walking together in the hills always reminded me of a solicitous mahout directing the steps of an elephant. This library was the apple of his eye. He spent hours every week looking through booksellers' catalogues. He used to say that he would rather be remembered by it than by anything he had written. It also gave him a lot of pain, because he could never find the book he wanted and knew was there and half the morning would be spent in fruitless rages. Then he would say that he had done far better work when he had only a few books and knew where every one of them was, which was true. Working in the library was the Baroness Anrep, who knew these rages well. Then came Il Berenzone and said, it was neither the one nor the other or something. And so he saw that we all began to laugh, and then we said, yes, Il Berenzone, he is Il Berenzone. Oh, the poor man, he was so frightened that he said, in heavens, I could have said, what heavens, what I might have said, without knowing. <laughs> After the war, B.B. became quite benevolent. And then, of course, there was another reason why, after the war, the atmosphere of Itati became so much sunnier. Nikki Mariano the sister of Baroness Anrep, who we've already seen. I ought to explain that she was a lady, half Balt, half Neapolitan, who had been introduced into Itati by Mrs. Berenson for complex personal reasons in about the year 1919. She was given the post of librarian, for which she had no qualifications at all, although she afterwards became quite a good scholar. She was the mainspring of the whole place and became, in effect, the second Mrs. Berenson, because Mrs. Berenson died in 1945, after being out of action for many years. Everyone who went to Itati loved her, and no one loved her more than Mr. Berenson. The year that Clark and Mora first visited Itati, 1925, was actually the year that Mussolini assumed dictatorial powers. For Mora, the purpose of this first visit was politics, not art. 
although, as I am sure you know, his mission was a fruitless one. In June 1925, the eminent socialist writer Gaetano Salvemini had been arrested. Salvemini was an old friend of the Berensons and looked remarkably like B.B. Mora's mission was to ask if he might borrow B.B.'s passport for him to effect an escape to Switzerland. The request did not meet with favour. Nevertheless, Nicky Mariano later recalled, from the first moment, there was such a feeling of warmth, of mutual understanding between this young man and the three of us, that he stayed on to supper that same day, and from then on became a constant visitor. His subtle intelligence, combined with great sensitivity, showed in his features and in his expression. A great help in his becoming almost a member of the family was his familiarity with the English language, literature and history. For Mary, at any rate, it was essential. She never felt really at home in another language and probably was never able to think in it. Eternity was a busy household which gave Morris something he had never had or experienced, but for which he craved – family life. His own mother had died when he was 12 years old and his elderly father when he was 20. His early education had been interrupted by illness and the search for cures. A study of law at university was frustrated by the First World War. His ambition to establish himself as a political writer and politician had been crushed by the rise of fascism. His Italian friends found him elusive and enigmatic, but the Anglo-Saxons found in him a kindred spirit which required no explanation and no unravelling. Mora's principal interest was with words and writing, not images and art. And what bound him to B.B. and made him such a regular visitor to Itati over the next 15 years was his network of young anti-fascist contacts. Yet their shared hatred of totalitarianism, which drew them so closely together pre-war, caused a temporary rift later after 1945 when B.B., with his fierce opposition to Stalin and the Russians, learned that Mora wrote for communist newspapers. Mora was the one to whom B.B. talked to most in those early years. He had a special gift for drawing out B.B., who once said, quote, He is simply perfect, and I feel not a thin sheet of paper between us. As Clark has mentioned, B.B. loved conversation. And even if his voice was never recorded, Mora made notes of what he talked about, which was later published as Colloquy con Berenson. So what was it that bound B.B. and Mora together, other than politics and contemporary events, and their opposition to totalitarianism in all its forms? Both had an insatiable curiosity, both were indefatigable sightseers, and had a deep love of the Italian landscape. Both liked the company of young people and their fresh ideas. Each found writing necessary but difficult, and each failed to bring much hope for writing projects to completion. But given to self-analysis and introspection and had a tendency to be aloof. Neither suffered fools gladly. But whereas B.B. could be merciless in his criticisms of others, Mora was always kindly, gentle, humorous, and sometimes endearingly childlike. Each had, I think, a great fear of loneliness, although each addressed their fears in different ways. B.B. surrounded himself with distractions and people. Mora faced his demons alone, in the dark hours of the night, determined to conquer them unaided. There were differences, of course. Mora was a perfectionist, capable of strict self-denial and was committed to an ideal of public service. He was completely without vanity or social snobbery, was unswervingly loyal to the people and causes that mattered to him and was astonishingly patient. 
These were not instinctive tendencies for B.B. Above all, Mora was loyal and patient through thick and thin, and he gave B.B. what he most needed, an active and engaged listener. That willingness to listen was perfectly summed up by his own close friend, Alessandro Dontrev. Dontrev said of Moro, quote, I think it was exactly that singular gift of sympathy, that interest, that inexhaustible curiosity about things and for people that so captured the affection and estimation of the old sage of Settignano. I think that Berenson might have seen and cherished in Umberto that quality which has become so rare in our compatriots of today. An acuteness of judgment, an absence of servility, with a mistrust of rhetoric, and above all, and this was a quality which Mora possessed in the highest degree, the art of listening. Mm -hmm.